Well, it's sort of now because he needs to speak. How am I going to switch to? Okay. Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Walton from the Institute of uh, Astronomy in Cambridge. I'm a member of Gaia Science team, and uh, I'm here to introduce our morning uh, 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 presentations around the upcoming Gaia data release free. And I'm speaking to you from Goonhilly outside Helston down in Cornwall, and Goonhilly is an Earth station. Uh, which is involved in downlink of data from Gaia. More about that down the line. Um, Gaia Data Release Free is our next major release, next major milestone, I think, in astrophysics. I think we can say that this is going to uh, fundamentally uh, alter our understanding of the cosmos. Uh, and it's uh, coming up at uh, 12 noon Central European uh, summer time, which is 11 o'clock. In, in the UK, and we're counting down to that with a number of very interesting uh, presentations. And here's a, a, a shot of some of the people involved in the uh, construction of the Gaia uh, data uh, resource. Uh, this is uh, um, the uh, order of play for the day. We're gonna have presentations covering not only the, the format of the data, we're also gonna be talking about uh, some of the uh, 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 science highlights that we can be expecting from the, the data products that are going to be released from the uh, from the new catalogue. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, some presentations on the, the overview and the, the global picture uh, with some uh, welcome comments from uh, colleagues here in Goonhilly, uh, from the Royal Astronomical Society and from the UK Space Agency. Uh, we count down to 11 o'clock and we will uh, cut through to... Uh, to the actual uh, red button event, if you like, when the data is released to the global uh, global community. Uh, the community being the astronomical community, the astronomers who are gonna benefit from the data products coming out, and also uh, uh, the wider public, because I should mention that the uh, the data that's out there is actually of, of, of great interest to, uh, to, to the, the, the general public as well. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, at nine o'clock, we're going to cut over to uh, to the European Space Agency to hear from uh, the Director General of the European Space Agency and the Director of Science of the European Space Agency. Um, and then we will come back to uh, the team that are presenting in, here in Goonhilly. Um, in a few short words, the processing task to actually generate the data from Gaia is a very complicated uh, task it takes a while we've got a dedicated team of experts uh, located in well, cambridge uh, edinburgh leicester uh, university college london and, and bristol and colleagues from those uh, uh, groups are, are involved in the program today and we're going to hear from georgia basso at uh, in cambridge about the spectrophotometric data and from mark cropper at ucl uh, on the radial velocity data then we're going to move over to the scientific discovery potential of, of, of Gaia and uh, 
present some of the uh, some of the some of the highlight areas that we think are going to be important over the coming years that we're expecting to see lots of scientific insight coming out of. Uh, Jerry Gilmore from the University of Cambridge will be uh, uh, giving a, a, a brief overview, showing the the steps, if you like, from astronomy to astrophysics, the observational to the understanding. And then we're going to uh, look with presentations on the uh, on the photometry and the, the, the chemistry and an overview of the complete release from uh, Francesca to Angeli, uh, George Seabrook and uh, David Wynne Evans. Uh, Francesca leads the uh, the processing centre in Cambridge. Uh, George uh, is the deputy lead of the uh, um, uh, processing for the radial velocity data, and uh, David uh, Evans uh, leads the development team for for Gaia in, in Cambridge. Um, and that is our uh, 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 screen. And I think we are eight fifty nine. So I think we will be moving over to uh, the presentations from ESA at this point. And this requires a switch of inputs and feeds. And at this point, we can move to the ESA TV and I think we will get the, the, the sound from that. And we have a, a a countdown and hopefully through the uh, audio channel we will pick up the sound from the user presentation and this is the lead into that. in Norway, the Netherlands, on behalf of the European Space Agency. My name is Kai Luske. I'm ESA's Communication Program Officer for Science. And today we are looking forward for the third data release of ESA's cornerstone mission Gaia, the billion star surveyor that has taught us enormous amounts of new knowledge about our Milky Way, our home galaxy, the life and death of stars, and our place in the universe. Thank you all for joining us. Today, we have an expert panel assembled. And to my right, I'd like to welcome Josef Aschbacher, ESA's Director General. To my left, Günther Hasinger, ESA's Director of Science. From ESAC in Villafranca, Spain, uh, Europe's uh, Space Astronomy Center, Timo Prusti, the Gaia project scientist for ESA. From Leiden, the Netherlands, Anthony Brown, the Gaia DPAC, the Data Analysis and Processing Consortium Chair Anthony Brown, and from the Instituto Nazionale de Astrofisica, based in Padua, Antonella Valenari, the Deputy Chair of the Gaia DPAC. Furthermore, we have uh, Connie Ayres. Connie is a professor at KU Leuven and at uh, Red Belt University, a scientist who was the lead author of one of the key papers and will discuss some of the results that came out of the data release. Now, um, I would like to hand over to Josef Aschbacher, our DG, to give us an ESA perspective of the upcoming data release. Thank you. So thank you, Kai, and uh, very welcome also from, from my side. Today is really an exciting day because this data release has been uh, waited for since, uh, since a long time. And uh, I've just had a discussion with my experts, with uh, Günther in particular. Two billion, data, two billion objects or stars are to be uh, monitored, and the data of those are being released uh, today. Uh, and this is really uh, incredible because it will uh, open the floodgates for new science and for new findings uh, of our universe, of our Milky Way. And I think this is, uh, is really fantastic. I'm a scientist myself, uh, as you know, not an astronomer, but uh, a geophysicist, uh, but uh, still 
knowing what it means if good data become available for science is always a, a very a very important moment because this opens uh, completely new dimensions of uh, finding uh, new results and uh, and really uh, di diving very deep into it and uh, see what uh, what you can find and what new theories and new algorithms and new uh, yeah, new, new knowledge you can uh, obtain from from this data. So this is really a fantastic day for astronomy, for science, uh, for ESA, uh, but really for all in Europe. And uh, let me just uh, by with a few words introduc of introduction thank all those who have been involved in producing these data sets. So of course the the science uh, teams themselves, but also uh, the engineers who have been working on Gaia in the past uh, to put the mission together and our member states, because as always, uh, our science program is composed of uh, different uh, elements and our member states are at the core of everything. First of all, they are uh, funding ESA and the science program, but also they are contributing extremely important uh, uh, instruments uh, or knowledge themselves through the research institutions and of course industry, uh, which uh, is uh, carrying out most of the uh, implementation development tasks. So really a big thank you from my side to the community, which makes up ESA and this Gaia mission being one of the core missions of the science program and uh, the science program being one of our backbones of the ESA activities. And this is really a fantastic day today. So thank you from my side. Thank you very much, Josef. Peter, would you like to yes. pick up the ball? Thank, thank you, Josef, uh, for picking more or less, for sending me the ball immediately. <laughs> so I'm indeed very proud to be directing the ESA science program. Um, and uh, the scientific program of ESA is indeed enabling scientists to take over leadership technology, scientific leadership, in a number of very important areas, um, from the solar system and the heliosphere to the galaxy and then to the very far reaches of the uh, galaxy and the universe. If I could show the slide with the um, fleet of the ESA missions in the, so in the um, looking at the universe, and you see um, as the different colors of the rainbow, uh, the different missions that we have. And in the middle row are the missions which are active right now. James Webb, Hubble, Gaia, um, and so on. And Gaia is basically in the middle of this map now and in the middle of our attention uh, today. Thank you for the slide. Um, uh, Gaia is really <clears throat> turning the world in astronomy upside down. And uh, the number of publications, as you may know, is skyrocketing. Um, every day, five papers for Gaia mission, from Gaia missions um, are published. And in the last three years, we have actually overtaken the gold standard in astronomy, the Hubble Space Telescope, and um, uh, are now producing about 1,600 papers uh, per year. And just in time for our meeting today, um, there have been two <clears throat> major prizes that have been given out um, last in the last two weeks um, for things that are also related to Gaia. So I'm very happy to congratulate Leonard Lindgren and Michael Perryman for receiving the Shaw Prize in astronomy um, for the development of astrometry and in particular the Hipparchus and the Gaia mission. And then I'm even more happy today to um, congratulate Connie Ertz, who we have here in our panel, uh, Jorgen Christen Dalsgaard and Roger Ulrich for the Kavli Prize. <clears throat> this has been given for developing of helioseismology and asteroseismology. And it turns out that astroseismology is now also a very important element of the Gaia mission. And with this, um, I hope for a wonderful day um, uh, of this data release um, and the splash of new results to come. Go Gaia, go. Go Gaia, go indeed. And talking about, uh, about catchphrases, you can follow this data release under hashtag Gaia DR3. You can uh, follow on Twitter, Isa Gaia, ESA Science or ESA. And if you want to find out anything about this mission, you can go to our landing page, esa.int slash Gaia. Now, to give us a rejoiner of this amazing mission, I'd like to hand the word over to Timo Krusty at the European Space Astronomy Center in Villafranca, our Gaia project scientist. Timo, please. Uh, good morning. Why are we getting this going then? I guess is my mic on? Yes. Excellent. Great. So I'm Robert Massey. I'm Deputy Director of the Royal Astronomical Society. And we're supporting this event today. We're very happy to be doing that. Because Gaia is such a fantastic project. And it's great that there's such UK involvement in it too. 
Um, so my job this morning is going to be to talk and try and chair the various contributors. There are a lot of them. I should warn you that I will be quite strict about time. Um, so do bear that in mind in your, uh, your allocations. And we'll tr maybe try and take one or two questions after each one. But if we're running out of time, that won't be possible. There is a scheduled slot for Q&A later on anyway. So it's my pleasure to start with uh, Dr. Georgia Busso from the University of Cambridge. I had to do quick bio searches for various people. She's from the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Her Twitter bio, which is an excellent place to find out things about people, says that she loves cycling and uh, she listens to most but not all types of music. So, you know, which I'm sure has absolutely no relevance whatsoever to what she's going to present right now about the Gaia spectrophotometric data. So over to you, Georgia. Thank you very much, Robert. So, yeah, uh, good morning all and thank you for being up here and also on the other side of the screen. <laughs> and so yes, I'm going to talk to you about this new data product that we're going to publish today with the third Gaia data release, which is the spectrophotometric data. So, well, as you heard, Gaia is one of the cornerstone mission of the, of the European Space Agency. Previous release focused more on the astrometry, that is the distances, the position, the motion of the stars, and on the uh, photometry, that is the brightness of the stars. And uh, uh, with the, this third release, we are actually, for the first time, releasing uh, the spectra. And, uh, um, on board guide, there are two spectrographs, a high resolution one, uh, but Mark after me will talk to you in detail about that, while I'm focusing uh, more on the uh, low resolution uh, spectrograph, which actually give the, uh, the spectrophotometric uh, uh, data. So, uh, well, I'm sure you all know these pictures. These are the cover of, <laughs> of the Pink Floyd uh, uh, album, The Dark Side of the Moon. I chose this picture for two reasons. One, is that uh, Pink Floyd are from Cambridge. And the other is that it really show nicely how light uh, can be uh, split in different uh, wavelength um, or colors. And this is the same principle that has been applied on board Gaia with the, uh, with the uh, um, low resolution, well, with the spectrograph. So uh, on board Gaia, there, are, uh, um, there is this instrument, these two instruments called the uh, blue and red photometers, uh, BP and RP uh, in shorts. Uh, that yeah, uh, observe light in two different uh, uh, wavelength uh, ranges. Uh, these are actually low resolution prism, uh, but even if they are low resolution, they can detect, uh, I mean, we can uh, um, see clearly differences in uh, the uh, type of stars. Here, uh, there are example of the spectra. Uh, so you have uh, here BP and here uh, the RP spectra and different uh, uh, colors uh, uh, represent a different type of stars. So you, you can appreciate the, the difference. Uh, Data users actually already use this data uh, because uh, the integration, the flux integration of uh, the spectra uh, gives the BP and uh, RP uh, magnitude that has been released in, uh, has been published in previous uh, uh, release. So uh, the data, so these are, uh, uh, we're going to release the in uh, less than two hours, uh, more than 200 million of uh, spectra. Uh, this plot show you the, uh, sky coverage of the of, of the data we are we're going uh, uh, to publish with uh, BP and RP spectra and you see that it's quite homogeneous all over the uh, the sky except for those two patches but that's due to the Gaia observing mode how, how Gaia scan the sky and is um, uh, mostly uh, uh, bright uh, uh, bright um, object so with a magnitude g brighter than 16 uh, uh, point uh, uh, 65 uh, <laughs> in the G magnitude, and they are mean spectra because, uh, uh, well, you might know that Gaia observed in average uh, a source for 80 times. So we combine all observation for one source and you obtain a mean, um, a mean spectra. But in future, we are going to uh, um, release, the, so this is not the last time that you heard from us, uh, uh, we're going to release also the epoch spectra, that is the single observation. So a quick word how the, the mean spectra are represented because it's how you find them in, uh, in the archive. Uh, so the uh, mean spectrum is a combination of a function or we use a, a Hermit uh, polynomials. And here you can, in the, the, the green plot here, show you the Hermit uh, polynomials. These are, um, um, 
function has actually been optimized to fit better the, the spectra. So we have been optimized from BP, and so you have this blue function here and or RP here. And uh, uh, yeah, depending on, uh, uh, we can use uh, uh, up to 55 optimized functions depending on the, 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 um, uh, the type of spectra uh, we, we, we're, going, uh, we, we're looking at. For instance, uh, here in uh, this uh, case, we have uh, uh, here uh, BP and RP. Uh, you have a, a spectrum that is quite smooth, so it needs only uh, um, fewer uh, basis functions. Here you have two and here 11. While in this other case, for instance, you have uh, uh, emission lines, many features, so you have uh, more than 50, you need more than 50 bases to represent uh, the, the spectra. Uh, so these are uh, um, internally calibrated spectra that is in the um, Gaia internal uh, reference system. And of course, these need to be bring to an absolute uh, um, system. And to do this, uh, we, uh, um, we use a um, set of, uh, uh, of objects, uh, including spectrophotometric standard stars, uh, quasars, uh, young cell object, uh, and emission line objects. In this way, we cover most of the shapes and the features in the spectra, and uh, we get uh, we obtain a very uh, a very accurate uh, calibration. Uh, in fact, uh, the accuracy uh, we reach an accuracy in the range between five and twenty uh, milli milli magnitude, which is uh, really amazing. Uh, of course, not everything is perfect because never, never, uh, never it is. There are still small systematics uh, and uh, there are still saturation issues for, uh, uh, for the very, uh, very bright stars. But still, uh, we, uh, yeah, uh, the accuracy is, uh, is amazing. Here in this plot, I'll show you the comparison uh, between uh, Hipparchos uh, and, uh, and Gaia. And uh, we managed to reproduce uh, the Hipparchos photometry, which was considered, well, Hipparchos was the, say, the father of Gaia, the, the previous mission, and uh, it was considered the benchmark of the um, photometric accuracy. And we managed to reproduce the Parkus photometry with a precision of uh, two point uh, less than uh, two point uh, five uh, millimagnitude. So uh, yeah, the spectra in the archive, it's uh, as I say, it's uh, more than two hundred million. Uh, it's a uh, only a subset if you uh, compare it to the whole uh, Gaia catalog, which is 1.8 billion of sources. Uh, but again, in the future, we'll release a spectra for all uh, sources. Uh, these are, as I say, internally, and, uh, intern we're going to release internal and calibrate, absolute calibrated uh, spectra. If you want to know uh, uh, which are the, the sources with the spectra, there are some flags in the archive that, uh, that you can check. And okay, uh, some uh, technical detail about how the uh, uh, how the, the, the spectra are um, are stored. But okay, you can you can look it up on uh, the, the documentation is quite good in explaining how to retrieve uh, to retrieve the spectra. Uh, in Cambridge, we develop uh, Gaia XPy, uh, which is a, a, an amazing tool that help uh, will help the users to handle uh, the uh, handle the data because it can calibrate the spectra to um, an absolute system uh, can uh, generate a sample spectra, uh, can compute synthetic photometry. But yeah, Francesca will tell you more about the about this uh, uh, later on. And uh, yes, uh, we, do, uh, we have this uh, uh, immense catalog of data. Really, uh, this is uh, the most uh, the biggest uh, catalog ever released, and also the most homogeneous. And we can look at, uh, uh, for instance, the structure and evolution of stars. Here you have the Erzsprung Russell uh, diagram. Uh, this is obtained with Gaia data. And uh, this is actually a nice app that was developed in, uh, was developed, uh, um, yeah, in our group. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, you can select uh, a, a star here in the color uh, in the Erzsprung Russell diagram, and uh, you can see uh, the spectrum. This, is, for instance, a, a solar like uh, a star. Then you have, for instance, here you have a low mass uh, uh, stars. You can appreciate the difference between the two spectra. 
uh, we have a white dwarf and a red uh, giant uh, branch uh, stars. So uh, comparing this, uh, the spectra with the uh, models, uh, with the uh, um, neural network technique, we can uh, find the parameters of the stars, like temperature, gravity, uh, chemical composition, radius, and so on. But not only that, we can also look at what uh, it's between, is between the, uh, the stars. For instance, uh, here, this, um, this movie show you uh, spectra uh, of um, uh, solar analogs, so stars that are like the sun but are located in different parts of the um, of the galaxies. And what's different uh, is the uh, um, the dust and the gas that uh, is uh, between the stars and the changes uh, uh, the, the the spectrum of the stars. So uh, we can actually so measure the 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 extinction uh, that occurs uh, this. And of course, we can do it not only for the solar analogs, but also for the other type of stars. And then we can uh, have, we can map the interstellar medium across the whole uh, galaxy. Uh, we can also look at uh, planets, planets around other, other stars. Uh, so here, these two plots show the uh, relation between uh, a mass of a planet and its radius. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, yeah again obtained uh, from the from the spectra. Uh, well, it, this is important uh, because uh, um, uh, yeah, better we know the the star, the host, and better we uh, are able to characterize the, the the planet. So yeah, as I say, here we have the mass and the uh, and the radius. The and it's a uh, color coded with the temperature of the of the host of the star. And here you have uh, uh, Earth-like planets, and here sir, you have Jupiter-like uh, uh, like planets. And we can compare the, 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 the data with, uh, with model and uh, trying to understand, for instance, the case of the Earth, well, the Earth the, 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 on the planets, uh, uh, what, what are their, their composition? For instance, the star here, it's, uh, uh, it's on the uh, rocky uh, planet uh, model, which is good because we are on a rocky planet. <laughs> And uh, we can also look at, uh, in our solar system, uh, a catalog of uh, 150,000 uh, um, asteroids is going to be released. And uh, for, for this, um, in this catalog, well, uh, we use the astrometry uh, to calculate the um, orbital parameters of the, uh, of the asteroids. And from the, uh, from the spectra, we can calculate the uh, reflectance. That is, uh, the, um, uh, the asteroids don't really emit uh, uh, light. They reflect the, the, uh, the sunlight. So comparing, uh, looking at the difference between the, the spectrum of the sun and the spectrum of the asteroids, uh, the difference depends on the composition and also on the, the shape and how it moves. Uh, um, of the asteroids, and then we, we can have uh, uh, information on that. And we can put everything together, like in this plot, you have uh, the orbital parameters and uh, uh, color coded by the, the reflectance. And you can see that there are different uh, uh, families of asteroids. So we can uh, uh, look more into detail if, uh, for instance, in a family of asteroids, the composition is homogeneous, we can compare it with uh, um, composition of uh, meteorites that are um, um, that we receive on Earth and and so on. But we can also look beyond our galaxy. We can uh, uh, again we have uh, we are going to release um, a catalog of more than six million uh, quasars uh, candidates. Uh, quasars are uh, distant uh, galaxies. And we can, uh, uh, and yeah, this is uh, the uh, sky uh, map of the of the this catalog of the, the quasar uh, uh, catalog, and uh, yeah, we can build a. Uh, reference composite spectrum and see how it changes uh, since uh, uh, how it changes uh, uh, well with distance uh, and uh, since uh, looking uh, at different distance we can look at uh, uh, different times uh, we can see how the spectrum of the quasars changes uh, uh, with time and finally it's going to take us some time because it's a very heavy plot <laughs> Yeah, here it is. So these are, uh, yes, it's one of my favorite plot of ever. Uh, it actually was uh, nominated on Twitter for Astro Plot of the Week. And <laughs> so the, here again, you have uh, the uh, Earth progress uh, uh, diagram. And for every square here, 
here on these uh, two uh, uh, other plots, you have the, uh, the Gaia data in the um, internal reference system and in the absolute uh, 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 system. Here. So you have this tiny spectra and uh, you can, uh, uh, actually here I can see very well because it's <laughs> really close. And uh, uh, you can really appreciate the difference and the, the, the coverage of the, all, uh, of, the, of the catalog. And uh, yeah, again, uh, it's going to take uh, again some time so, to do this because, yeah, that. Uh, so uh, again, uh, that was uh, on Twitter uh, the other day. Uh, Gaia is a um, truly game changing mission. It's already started to change everything uh, and it will continue so, uh, to do so for uh, also also the, the next uh, in the future so yeah we we deliver this amazing catalog to the uh, scientific community and so we we hope that uh, well i hope that everybody will be happy about that and yeah and that's it Thank you, uh, Georgia, and thank you for keeping to time as well. So um, I know we have various people watching via the internet on Zoom and so on. So I'm looking at my colleagues at the back. Is anybody, does anybody have any questions there? No, okay. Well, let's move on then in that case. Thank you, Georgia, to Mark Cropper. Um, so Professor Cropper is from the Mullard Space Science Laboratory. Um, he's uh, also holds a chair of the Department of Space and Climate Physics at University College London, hails from South Africa, graduated from the University of Cape Town, and his work was actually recognized by the Royal Astronomical Society with a service award from us in 2018. And Mark is gonna talk us through the radial velocity data from Gaia now. Thank you, Thank you Robert. Sorry, I'm not sure how to get through to the other. Folder at the bottom there, top right icon. There we go. No, that's the so, so email, that's isn't it? Yellow. That's okay, thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm had I just put it in screen now for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. This presentation is just to introduce the spectroscopic data from, from Gaia. And uh, the data comes from uh, 34 million stars uh, distributed over the sky like this. And that this is a, a plot of the density on the, the color scale is just the number of stars per small area on the sky. Uh, so uh, the main uh, aim of, of Gaia is to understand the, the history of the Milky Way, how it uh, was formed, its life history, and perhaps where it's going to, uh, how it's going to evolve in the future. And to do that, you need to know uh, how, the, uh, how, the how the galaxy looks now and how the stars in it are moving. And then also, secondly, um, what sort of stars are in the Milky Way and what are their ages and what are they made of, basically. Uh, uh, for the first, um, the, for the first, uh, uh, inf the, the information that's required to to to, to examine the motions are uh, derived through astrometry. These are uh, this is the the motion of the star across the sky, uh, across the sky, the stars across the sky, and also spectroscopy, which provides the motion in the line of sight, in and away from us. And then uh, the second uh, category of information that's required requires photometry, and you've just heard from uh, Georgia and also spectroscopy. And in this particular case, in this presentation, I'm talking about the higher resolution spectroscopy, which tells us about the sorts of stars. And Gaia, by having these three different approaches really is a complete toolkit to understand uh, the Milky Way. So we've seen this plot from Georgia, light, uh, we're familiar with uh, light coming in and split up by, uh, uh, by, uh, by, for example, a prism here, and uh, into, into, into a range of colors. Uh, the Gaia version for the radial velocity spectrometer is the, the one on the, on, on, on the right of the screen. And it's, it's, it's a, a, a beautiful optical model, mo module, uh, very much more complex, of course, than just a, a prism. Um, and it it's, it's takes the, the, the light from each star and it, it splits it up into a, a range of colors. 
and projects those onto the, uh, the, uh, 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 an array of, of 12 detectors on the Gaia focal plane. Those are the other detectors for the, for the astrometry and for the, the photometry you've just heard from Georgia and the 12 on the right are, are for the spectrometer. Uh, these wavelengths are just from a, a narrow red range of the spectrum. Uh, and um, this is what a typical spectrum looks like from, from, from the spectrometer. Uh, you can see uh, the, the, the bottom axis is color. So uh, it's red wavelengths on the, on the left and even redder wavelengths on the right. And this is brightness uh, uh, intensity, if you like, the number of uh, amount of energy in the spectrum. And you can see that there are edges to the spectrum, which is uh, caused by the filter, which cuts off the longer wavelengths and the shorter wavelengths in this narrow band. This narrow band is selected because uh, it contains a lot of information in a small space. And you can see here, um, uh, particular uh, uh, markers or characteristics, these, emission, these, these absorption lines, these dips in the spectrum, which are characteristic of different elements. And I've marked here calcium, iron, and titanium. And the strength of these, um, these uh, dips will tell you a lot about the spectra, or about, the, the, about what the star is made of. And you'll hear, you'll hear more um, later from George Seabrook about this. The spectra have different um, characteristics depending on how hot and cool they are, how hot and cool the stars are. Uh, cooler ones have these sort of broken up spectra at the top, the smoother ones at the bottom right. Uh, and uh, you saw the one I've just shown you somewhere in the middle here. And from this, uh, this you, can, you can derive things like the temperature, the density of the stars, in other words, the star very bloated, involved star, uh, like a, a red giant, uh, or how polluted they are by previous generations of, of, of stars which, which, which have seeded the gas uh, from which the later generations are, are made. So uh, it tells you some, to some extent uh, about the age of the stars as well. Now on this release, we, don't, uh, we, we, we haven't released the very cool ones and the very hot ones. That's simply because we're not yet, uh, uh, either we're not yet fully uh, in, in control of the, some of the um, understanding some of the uh, the, the aspects of the data processing, particularly for the cooler stars and for the hotter stars, we just simply need more measurements and we've only got the first three years of the mission so far. Um, okay, so I've, I've told you a little bit about the sorts of stars and given you um, uh, some idea of how we extract that information. And as I said a moment ago, George Seabrook will tell you more. So now I'm going to move to uh, the, the, um, the, the kinematics, the motions of the stars, the orbits of the stars in the Milky Way. So going back to that Hipparchus uh, uh, spectrum, if the, if, if, gas, if the star was exactly at rest with respect to us, then we would see the spectrum. But if it was moving away from us, that spectrum would be slightly shifted towards the red. So um, all this is caused by the Doppler effect of light. And if it's moving towards us, it's conversely, um, sorry, it's conversely shifted towards the blue, towards this end of the spectrum. So simply by measuring this shift compared to a reference wavelength that we might have measured in the, in, in the laboratory, uh, that little shift tells us about the speed with which the star is uh, approaching us or, 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 or moving away from us. And that, um, that, uh, that, that then gives, uh, um, that then gives the, that provides the, the line of sight uh, velocity, uh, which complements the astrometry, which gives the uh, transverse velocity on the sky. And with those three dimensions, one can then reconstruct the orbits, understand where those stars will be in the future, understand how those orbits are affected by the different structures in the Milky Way, such as the spiral arms or the bulge. So the spectroscopy provides information, crucial information in both of these, areas and in Gaia DR3 there are a million spectra released about eight about as six six to seven million spectra are used in actually understanding the compositions of the stars and then uh, from the kinematics from the motions of the stars there are 34 million radio velocities these are the line of sight velocities as I've just mentioned these are massive numbers uh, these huge catalogs now I'll tell you a little bit about what's in what's what what uh, about about the reach of the radial velocities in the catalog, and this on the left is um, um, a, a plot of the Milky Way looking down from the uh, from 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 above onto it. Um, the position of this of the the center of the Milky Way is on the right hand side, 
Um, and uh, the position of the sun is here in the brighter area here. And it's brighter because this is a density plot. It's the number of stars per, uh, per, per, um, uh, uh, per, per, per unit area. And um, this, is, this area is obviously much brighter because there are lots of fainter stars in our area, but which we can, we can, we can, we can measure with a spectrometer. So they're just more, 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 more accessible stars in that region. And you can see from, from this plot that the, that the stars that we measure extend beyond the center of the Milky Way with the spectrometer and then out to the furthest edges of the, the Milky Way. And um, so approximately half of the Milky Way is now covered in this data release in terms of understanding the motions of the stars. On the right-hand plot is the edge, edge on view. Uh, again, the, the center of the Milky Way is on the right there and it's mostly obscured by dust. So you don't see that many stars there, but we do see a few in that sort of region. Uh, and again, the brighter area is where the, the, there's the position of the sun. And you can see from this plot that we also see way above the Milky Way disk and then way below the Milky Way disk um, because the disk is in the horizontal uh, plane in this plot. Uh, you can also see streaks going below the, 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 uh, the Milky Way and outside. And these are two to the Magellanic clouds, which are, uh, which are, are, are satellite galaxies um, orbiting, orbiting the Milky Way. So, this gives you some idea of the coverage. It's very extensive now in this release uh, compared to the earlier date release too. So the next plots all have, um, all have uh, um, RBS magnitudes. So this is basically the brightness of the star in the particular band uh, that's measured in the spectrometer. So you have uh, brighter stars here and fainter stars there. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 which call it um, naked eye stars can, are, are seen down to roughly uh, magnitude five and a half or six in this band. And the, 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 the catalog extends to uh, uh, um, an RBS magnitude of 14, which if you use the normal, normal magnitudes, um, broadband magnitudes uh, more commonly used, like uh, for example, the Kron uh, Cousins bands, uh, then you, you're reaching around about magnitude getting on for magnitude 15 for a solar type stars. Um, the, the, the blue is um, in, in the previous uh, release and data release two, we, we reached up to magnitude 12 in this band, RBS band, and we're now reaching to, to magnitude 14. And it's a log plot here. So most of the stars are in now in the, in the green area. This plot shows uh, the completeness. So that basically is the fraction of stars that we see in the spectrometer compared to those seen in the astrometry and, and the completeness between magnitude two and, and down to magnitude 14 is, is above 80% and reaching um, sort of 90% in, in most places. So that means that most stars in this range actually have a velocity associated to them, uh, which is very important for, uh, for understanding, um, for, understand, for, for being able to model and understand the, 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 the orbits in the Milky Way. Uh, so um, the incre increases in, 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 in this release compared to the previous data release three or data release two, which are pretty much the same, um, is, is shown it's the difference between the red curve and the black curve. The black curve is, the da this, is this data release and um, the, the completeness is, is because uh, in, 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 in this range, is, is, is arrived at because we're able to use stars, uh, spectra which are blended. So where, where, where the actual spectrum is overlapping between one, um, uh, uh, one or other uh, from, over from, two, from two stars, we're able to separate that information. And there are various other improvements which have allowed us to increase the completeness. And of course, we've moved from, we've, 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 we, the limiting magnitude has gone from 12 to 14. So there are a huge number of stars uh, in that new um, fainter star range. And of course, that's really important to increase the ray, the, the area the, or the volume of the Milky Way that we are observing. This, uh, this plot shows the accuracy of these measurements in compared to other uh, 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 catalogs, uh, ground-based catalogs here. And uh, you can see that throughout the range, the, 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 the the RBS, the, the Gaia radial velocity spectrometer is pretty uh, much consistent with, um, with the ground-based uh, catalogs, which are, are much smaller, of course, um, um, except for the, 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 the blue Lamos curve, which is a little, 
discordant um, for reasons I don't really know. Uh, and these are for dwarfs and giants. And the, the difference that the accuracy is, is, is good to a few hundred meters per second. And this plot, this final plot shows uh, the precision of the measurements as a function of the brightness of the stars. So, um, so here we have for giants, um, and it's with slightly different uh, metallicity. And remember, and George will tell you more about metallicity later, but it's the, it's the strength of those, 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 those features in the spectrum, um, which affects the, the precision slightly. But um, the precision, which is essentially the error bar on each measurement, uh, each velocity measurement, is something like uh, one kilometer a second at 12th magnitude in, in, the, Gaia, in the RVS band, and around about six, um, six kilometers a second uh, at the 14th magnitude limit. And these, these numbers are, 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 are perfectly suitable for, for, create, for, 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 for reconstructing the orbits within the galaxy. So um, this is a, a, very, um, a very good resource for, those, for, for understanding the galactic dynamics. Okay, so in this, just a summary, um, uh, the spectroscopy is contributing to understanding both the, the, the orbits, the motions, the stars in the Milky Way, and also what the stars are made of, um, something about them, uh, their ages, their, 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 uh, their, um, their, their temperatures, their densities, and so on. Um, and uh, this information is crucial for understanding not only the, 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 the stars and the, 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 the information on the stars themselves, but also the general gravity in uh, the, the galactic potential, the gravitational potential within the galaxy. And that means also including, um, it, it tells you about the, 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 how much gas there is in the galaxy, also about how much dark matter there is in the galaxy, because all of that um, adds to the potential which governs the way these stars move. So there are million spectra released in DR3 to summarize 300 and, uh, th uh, 34 million spectra in the uh, line of sight velocities. And so we, this is a, this is a um, complementary and fundamental information really on an unprecedented scale compared to previous catalogs. Uh, and it's another Gaia uh, release, which is unique for everyone uh, to use. And we, we uh, recommend it to the community. That's all from you, Robert. Mark and um, I think uh, you know uh, our colleague Carol Haswell was here this afternoon described it as a playground for astronomers, which I think is a very appropriate description. Um, so um, I'll just check if there's any questions coming through on Zoom. Uh, this week. Oh, okay, all right. Well, let's move on then. In that case, so uh, to the science results, because a lot of people have asked about the discoveries that are emanating from this data set, and it's my pleasure to start that off with uh, Professor uh, Jerry Gilmore, um, and he is the my glasses on the Professor of Experimental Philosophy, philosophy, even at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, and has a long and distinguished career in astronomy, actually looking at the structure, origin, and evolution of our galaxy. And crucially, he was involved with Gaia from its very inception, and actually was one of the people persuading the European Space Agency to go ahead with the mission. So I think it's incredibly fitting that we've got uh, Jerry introducing uh, this part of the session. So while he just gets set up. Okay, and we'll hear from a couple of speakers who are presenting that first bit of the science results in a second. <coughs> Great, over to you, Jerry. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here. <coughs> so I'm just going to introduce briefly the uh, concept of what is the first full Gaia data release. So this is the first. This is the first time we've had uh, the full richness of what Gaia can deliver to the community. Uh, but of course, the point of Gaia is for us to understand the universe. <clears throat> and so let me just put this in context and say, how do we understand things? <clears throat> we understand things through our senses, which are listed at the top there. And each of those provides some information, <clears throat> which is effectively a dimension. This is all independent. So when we look at something, Gaia looks at something, tells you where it is, because Gaia has two mirrors, the same as our two eyes. It tells us a distance, and from that we get a size. Then you wait, look again, and then you deduce all of these things. <clears throat> and similarly, from the spectroscopy, we can deduce the chemistry and structure in the same way that we touch and taste. <clears throat> uh, and Gaia also listens uh, by very precise measurements of, of astro-seismology oscillations. And from sound, of course, we can tell the structure of something. <clears throat> and so from the Gaia data, 
we can deduce exactly those parameters. Now, each of these things is separate and it's called a dimension. People get confused with dimensions, but the common dimensions of space and time are the first four, but actually you can have as many as you like. And Gaia gives us at least 12. So we start with positions, then we have a parallax, get a distance, <clears throat> and we wait and we see proper motions, get transverse velocities. The spectra now available for the first time provide the Doppler shift to move into six dimensions so we know where an object is and, and its speed and velocity <clears throat> and the spectra also tell us the properties plus the photometry tell us the properties <clears throat> and so we can have all of these independent pieces of information about every object and about the big picture and that's the key to Gaia is putting it all together <clears throat> so what is Gaia doing well it's it, it is continuing to enable a complete revolution astronomy is just a different thing than it was five years ago <clears throat> Uh, the good news, of course, is that Gaia is spectacularly productive, and so there are of order four or five proper peer-reviewed science analysis papers published on average every day. We can imagine a flurry of these starting tomorrow from the new <coughs> data release. It'll be interesting to see who's first. But the thing is that these are, are, are very, very broad in impact. They're revolutionizing across all of modern astrophysics. <coughs> uh, and so they're not only telling us about the structure of our galaxy and its history, but also many, many other things like the structure of stars. Now, why is this so impressive? Well, there are three things Gaia delivers. The first is precision. Gaia is simply about a factor of 10,000 more accurate than anything we've had before. <clears throat> but also it's got it right. The numbers are robust. You can believe them. This is critical. And this is the hard work of the people who have been talking to you and will continue to talk to you, <clears throat> is that a, a small error bar means nothing unless it's reliable, and it is. And also it's true for a very, very large amount of information. <clears throat> and so Gaia just gives what is needed for people across the universe, across the milk, the, uh, their world. <laughs> it's possible that we're being eavesdropped on as well, you never know, <laughs> but across the world to just take off. Uh, and our original statement <clears throat> long, long ago was that we wanted to set the Milky Way galaxy up as a Rosetta Stone, something that was sufficiently well understood that when we get things like the Hubble telescope and James Webb looking at some faint fuzzy blob <clears throat> very, very early in the universe, we can say, aha, this is what it is going to turn into much in 10 billion years time. And, and we can see the pieces uh, coming together in real time uh, with James Webb, but what they turn into uh, accurately <coughs> with the Milky Way. And this is just one of the many, many pictures. It's just illustrating the point with a cartoon Milky Way in the background, that there's precision information available for roughly half of the volume of the Milky Way. <coughs> and so that means we have a true census the goal, another goal of Gaia was to measure 1% of the population of the Milky Way, <clears throat> and it is doing that. And that's enough that with intelligence that one can deduce the properties of the whole thing. <clears throat> and so the real statement that Gaia is doing is going beyond the generic, so these cartoon models that we already had, to do real detailed precision science. <clears throat> I'll give you just one example. <clears throat> how far that is it's an interesting question is where basically where do we come from where do the chemical elements that we in our part of the milky way are made come from and this has been a, a, a challenge well forever probably <clears throat> but certainly it became a science uh, back in the middle of the last century and it's been a continuing challenge ever since because it's a complex problem there are many many different ways in which the chemical elements are created and they're dispersed differently and then when things are made they move around as well so one of the many ways in which uh, <clears throat> these, this issue was studied is by looking at young star clusters, because there we can tell the ages of things. And so we've got a snapshot of what the Milky Way is like today. And the state of the art before today was from last week, actually, where this <coughs> Gaia ESO survey, a 10 year survey using the largest telescopes that Europe owns, biggest large telescope survey ever done, produced this set of open cluster results. Very, very precise error bars, very detailed. <clears throat> and so you can see, looking at this, if you look interior to the, to the galaxy, you can see that old stars have more chemical elements than young stars. And if you look further out, then you see the outer parts of the galaxy have fewer chemical elements than the inner parts. This is the basic story of how galaxies evolve. <clears throat> and it's uh, puzzling or not obvious why older, objects at the same place should have more chemical elements 
than younger things at the same place because the chemical elements increase with time. So this is telling us that there isn't a one dimensional answer, things move around. But this is the limits of what we knew as of Friday. Uh, whereas now we have this sample, and this is just one teensy subset of what Pyre is doing. But you can just see the richness of the information content that's still in there. It hasn't been explored. That's what the community will be doing over the next few years. But it will be able to understand things like why chemical elements apparently decrease uh, in a distance and why they decrease with radius. So that's just one example. It took us 10 years to get to that. <clears throat> It'll take another decade to understand what's the richness of what's going on inside there. Now, <clears throat> let me summarize then. <clears throat> so I went, <clears throat> you can read this for yourselves. The key is that all of these things essentially bring our Milky Way galaxy into focus. <clears throat> and so we can see where things really are. We can see how they move. That tells us about gravity, of course. Uh, where the mass is, not only the mass we can see, but the dark matter, and where everything came from. <clears throat> and so we're moving to really understanding our galaxy. Now, let me end on a, on a personal note. It was just on 30 years ago that a handful of us got together <clears throat> and wrote the first proposal that became Gaia. And it was just exactly 22 years ago that I was uh, part of the three of us who presented Gaia to the European Space Agency for its approval which it was, happily. <clears throat> 20 years later, an awful lot of hard work has led to this beautiful science has advanced on the backs of the very hard work of the many people who are talking to you today. Thank you. Can I argue with that? I suggest we take Francesca and uh, George and see if there are questions that follow from that. So uh, Francesca, uh, Francesca D'Angeli, she's a senior research associate at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge as well. She came to the UK from Padova and she heads up the Cambridge Data yeah, Processing five, Centre yes. for the Gaia mission. Thank you. Thank you. She will talk us through the photometry, the, sort of the light output from the uh, Gaia mission. So over to you when you're ready, uh, Francesca. Thank you. I'm not sure why it's not starting from the first one. Okay. They're going to have a very long voicemail and a very confusing one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks all uh, for being here. And uh, yes, so today, together with the, with the main data product of Data Release 3, uh, we are releasing also a number of uh, a number of papers that focus on the performance specification activities and results uh, obtained within DPAC. So these papers are really aimed at uh, um, assessing the quality uh, of the of the data that we are releasing uh, on some uh, of the well most likely uh, uh, use cases that people will want to use this data for, and also to provide guidelines to the users of the, of the data. Uh, and what I'm focusing here now is one of these papers, uh, which is uh, on uh, synth deriving synthetic photometry from the BPNRP spectra uh, that Georgia talked about earlier. So uh, how do we get synthetic photometry? So usually synthetic photometry is computed uh, by integrating over a given wavelength or frequency range, uh, the product of a spectral energy distribution from an object uh, uh, times a uh, um, transmission curve. Uh, well, the Gaia BP and RP spectra provide a low resolution spectral energy distribution because they are calibrated to absolute wavelength and flux, and they can therefore be used to uh, generate synthetic photometry. So here you see in the three panels, so you see on the left, so they're all for the same object, uh, which is one of our external calibrators. And on the left, you see uh, the external um, ground-based high resolution spectrum of that object. And this is one of the object, one of the spectra that were uh, obtained in an ad hoc campaign to, um, that, uh, that was uh, created to, uh, to collect the spectra exactly for the purpose of calibrating the BP and P spectra and the photometry. Uh, in the central panel, you see for the same object, the internally calibrated BP and RP spectra in blue and red. 
Uh, and finally, on the right panel, you see in the cyan curve uh, the uh, resulting absolute spectrum from Gaia, which is the com obtained combining together the information from the blue and the red photometers. Overlapped uh, uh, on the third plot, uh, you also see some bands, and those are the, the bands of the past, the, sorry, the past bands of the Johnson Crone Cousins uh, photometric system, uh, is one of the most widely used uh, uh, photometric systems uh, um, uh, today. And uh, you can see that uh, all the five bands uh, are, um, well, are within the range covered by the BP and RP spectra between 330 and uh, 1050 nanometers, with the exception of the U band, uh, uh, which I'll uh, discuss uh, later. Um, but uh, the other bands, uh, and being broad bands, uh, they are quite uh, well suited for this uh, for the purpose of generating synthetic photometry. Of course, you, uh, when you go to narrower bands, then you have to uh, be careful that the wide, the width, uh, the characteristic width of the pass bands uh, is not uh, uh, smaller than the line spread function of the of the spectra at that same wave, uh, wavelength range. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you understand that uh, using this technique, what we can have uh, we, is a, a catalog of synthetic photometry in any passband that uh, is uh, enclosed within that uh, wavelength range, uh, and that has suffi a sufficient, uh, uh, sufficiently large uh, width uh, for 220 million sources that are that have been observed from space uh, homogeneously uh, calibrated to absolute uh, wavelength scale uh, and that they are uh, unbiased basically in the selection down to magnitude 17 and 65 below instead uh, there is just a selection which is in, in that indeed biased um, of course, there are a few caveats to keep in mind. So there are some systematics in the BP and RP data that we know of and are well discussed, described in the papers, in particular in the bluest range for wavelength shorter than 400 nanometers. Um, you can see um, the effect of some of these systematics on the synthetic photometry for the SDSS uh, system here on the right. So here uh, there are four SDS uh, bands shown, the ultraviolet is not shown here, um, and uh, each plot shows the difference between the, be between the um, top quality uh, uh, photometry available in these bands for a, for a specific data set and the synthetic photometry generated from BP and RP data for the same sources. Um, on the, the left panels show the dependency of these differences with magnitude, whereas the right panels show it with respect to color. You can see there are uh, there are systematic effects there. Uh, there is a, a, a percent in magnitude uh, changes in the zero point, and also there is a trend with magnitude, which is particularly uh, well, significant uh, for magnitudes lower than 17, so at the faint end of the, of the data that is available in DR3. Uh, and there are trends in colors. Uh, however, what, mm, what, we have, uh, um, what we have done is uh, we have uh, used an approach that is called uh, standardization, where you basically use uh, a top quality um, catalog, uh, external catalog in a given photometric system to constrain basically to um, adapt and adjust the definition of the uh, of the pass bands that we then use for the synthetic photometry to minimize the, the, these systematic effects. And uh, um, if you focus now on the plots on the right, you can see that by using the standardized version, you can uh, minimize, remove almost all of those systematics, and you get to, you can get to really uh, well millimagnitude uh, accuracy uh, for all bands, uh, particularly broad bands uh, that are um, rather than 400 nanometers. Uh, for the now uh, coming more, focusing more on the ultraviolet bands. Uh, so what happens is, uh, well, here you see um, in the thick lines uh, show the BP and IP pass bands, uh, whereas uh, the other lines, thin lines and dashed lines show uh, here the Johnson Chrome cousin system and the SDSS uh, bands in dashed. Uh, you can see that the ultraviolet bands uh, are 
really very close or beyond the edge of uh, of the blue uh, of the BP and IP of the BP band. Sorry, um, there is on top of that there is the additional problem that anyway the bluest uh, uh, range below um, 400 nanometers is notoriously the most difficult to calibrate because we have very few calibrators that have significant flux in that area. So that's a, um, well, a known and a common problem uh, and uh, well, which is affecting also our data. Um, well, this, the left plot is just showing a zoom of that, uh, uh, of that wavelength range with a few uh, of the most uh, well, widely known and used uh, photometric systems. Uh, nevertheless, we can attempt uh, uh, to improve the situation with standardization also in this case. So here on the, in the right panel, you see similar plots to what I showed before. So differences between state-of-the-art photometry and synthetic photometry from Gaia in the uh, Johnson and SDSS uh, uh, ultraviolet bands. You can see the spread of the data is much, much larger, but it's also because the signal to noise uh, uh, for these sources uh, uh, for in these bands uh, is much lower because there is much less flux usually. Uh, but with standardization, we can get quite a good agreement uh, over uh, an extensive uh, uh, magnitude and color range. Uh, here you see the same plot. This is exactly the same data, but with a selection on signal to noise uh, to be above 30. So that's a, a reasonable uh, um, a filter that uh, people may want to apply to the photometry. And you can see that with that filter, you get quite a nice, uh, nice agreement using the standardized bands. So um, why can this be useful? Well, I'm, well, I'm sure most of you are already uh, sold to that idea, but uh, it, well, it has been extremely useful for us internally for our validation and for cross-checking our own results, not only uh, within uh, um, the photometric processing, but also, uh, for instance, in the coordination unit, with the coordination unit that uh, looked at the at deriving astrophysical parameters from the spectra. So as I'll show some results. Uh, uh, well, as I said, we have used uh, um, this for our own validation, but uh, and of course, uh, just plotting uh, color magnitude diagrams in known photometric systems like uh, the Johnson here on the left uh, for the ecliptic poles region and uh, in the SDSS filters for the large Magellanic cloud in the right plot. Uh, well, you can see how uh, well well defined and sharp are the features in these diagrams. Uh, show improving the excellent accuracy that uh, that is being uh, achieved with this uh, with this um, approach uh, you can of course uh, think about exploring a combination of other uh, systems. Uh, so here, well, uh, I'm, I've chosen one. I've chosen the one that I think look nicer because <laughs> it looks really like a, an SE monster <laughs> with fins uh, swimming. This is a color color diagram uh, mixing uh, SDSS and uh, Johnson systems. Um, here again, you can see very nicely defined uh, several uh, uh, evolutionary stages and sequences from the con known color color plots. Uh, Tools like these can be used, for instance, to find uh, um, optimal combinations of, um, of filters, uh, bands, uh, to explore astrophysical parameters, uh, uh, to define indicators for metallicity, alpha elements, in distance, uh, and uh, to calibrate them using the uh, very good, uh, well, high accuracy Gaia data that we have available, and then be applied, for instance, to uh, objects and observations that are uh, of objects that are further away and that cannot be reached with Gaia. But uh, um, we can, of course, use this also to test the systems that have not been realized yet or that may never be. Uh, I don't know. This, for instance, is the case uh, of the um, photometric system that was designed uh, to be implemented on Gaia. Uh, this was the Gaia 2 design, which uh, then was uh, replaced by the Gaia 3 design, which contains the low resolution spectra. But in initially, the plan was to have a set of broad and medium bands that were specifically uh, designed to optimize uh, the, the return uh, in terms of astrophysical parameters. So now, well, we can actually check 
uh, what would have been the performances of that system, and we can use that system to uh, cross-check our own results obtained from the spectra. So in this case, for instance, here the left plot uh, uh, shows a cross-check with the GSP-4 results, which, uh, which is the module that uh, uh, derives astrophysical parameters from the BPLP spectra. So here the color coding is done according to the GSP-4 results, but you can see how in the color-color diagram shown here, the split between uh, uh, main sequence and giants is uh, really nice uh, and uh, clearly agrees fantastically well with, uh, with the results of the GSP-4. In the central plots, uh, instead, we are looking at GSP-spec results, which are obtained from the RVS data. So there, both plots show the results of, uh, in terms of alpha elements and metallicity abundance for, from GSP-spec. And the color coding is done using two color indices from this uh, C1 system. So the top one obviously uh, really has a, um, a very tight link with the alpha elements abundance, whereas the bottom one has a, a link with metallicity. And uh, of course, GSP spectral results are um, more accurate uh, coming from higher resolution spectra, but uh, this technique can be applied to many more sources from the BP and RP data. And it's really um, a quick, uh, a quick a way to obtain a quick uh, indication of these uh, parameters. And finally, the right plot uh, is just to show well, how uh, nice uh, is the accuracy, how good is the accuracy in this photometric system where you can uh, see uh, the Zhao gap that has been observed and discovered from uh, Gaia broadband photometry that came in previous releases, but it's very visible in this photometric system as well, though showing that the accuracy is comparable to what we had uh, in the broadband photometry. And finally, we can look at future systems. So this is just a, well, uh, a fun uh, way of looking at what a JWST will look at, we'll see, uh, at least uh, in the near come uh, instrument at the optical bands, therefore, um, of course, JST, JWST then will uh, add to it uh, the uh, infrared, those being able to observe better the disk, but uh, okay, uh, JWST data is not there yet, but we can already see with the eyes of uh, JWST. Uh, so together with this paper, there are two bonus products uh, in data release three. One is a catalog of synthetic photometry in some well-known systems for uh, the 200 uh, million sources. And this is available via the archive, is queryable from the archive and can be uh, cross-matched with uh, the Gaia data. And then there is a, a catalog of uh, white dwarfs, so 100,000 white dwarfs. Um, and there again, you have a synthetic photometry in a few systems, plus uh, uh, classification in DA and non-DA from a random forest uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, and yeah, this is my last slide, and this is just showing the variety of systems that are today already available in Gaia XPy out of the box. So you can use Gaia XPy uh, to just uh, provide a list of source IDs and get photometry in all these systems from the BP and spectra. Uh, George Seabrook from the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, who does, uh, unfortunately for him, also put information about himself online on Twitter as well. He's a uh, senior research associate at the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, part of University College London, and as well as being part of the UK Gaia team, he describes himself as a good footballer, a fast snowboarder, and a failed astronaut. So uh, he's going to talk us through the chemical cartography of the Milky Way. So, yeah. George, when you're ready. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so the first thing I've learned is uh, to update my uh, Twitter bio. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for that introduction. Um, so going back to Jerry's talk, Jerry introduced the, the multiple dimensions of Gaia. And so it's my very great pleasure to, to introduce to you the, the chemical dimension. So in his talk, Mark showed you the RVS, the radio velocity spectrometer um, spectra. So in essence, we have brightness on the, on the y-axis and, and wavelength on the x-axis. Uh, and Mark talked to you about the, how the radio velocities were derived from, from these absorption lines, so these dips in the brightness. So I'm gonna concentrate on the, on the chemistry of these lines. 
So the fact that we can see these dips or these absorption lines here means that these elements are in the atmosphere of the star and they're blocking the light from escaping from that star. And so we, we see an absence of flux here. And so it's from spectra that we can, we can infer the, the presence of these uh, atoms in the star's atmosphere. So you can see from this particular example, the strongest lines are, are calcium, they're the most uh, prominent ones, but also all the other um, uh, uh, chemical elements that are within the RBS spectrum are color coded here. Um, and so you can see through the different colors, uh, many different uh, 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 of, of these elements. So I'll, I'll also just quickly take a, a quick diversion just to mention that not only do, do the RBS spectra contain uh, the absorption lines, which are, which are as I say, the, the elements in, in the star's atmosphere, it also, the, the light coming from the star to us also gets absorbed uh, by things that are in between us and that star. And one particular example are these diffuse interstellar bands here. So these are mysterious macromolecules uh, which inhabit the space between the stars and us in the interstellar medium. And by measuring the strength of them, uh, along different sight lines to all these different stars, we can make uh, very detailed maps uh, and, uh, and try and infer what these are from the dust maps that, uh, that Georgia showed. But I won't say any more about that other than that uh, this is also, um, as Francesca was mentioning, one of the performance verification papers. This is the topic of one of those performance verification papers. But I'm concentrating on the, on the chemistry of the stars, uh, which, is, which is one of the other performance verification papers. So chemical elements, as has already been mentioned, uh, heavier than hydrogen and helium are called metals uh, by astronomers, uh, uh, just to be slightly perverse because uh, they're not all metals in the full uh, chemistry sense. Uh, but these are, but, so we measure these, um, these chemical elements and here's the, uh, the periodic uh, table of, of all the chemical elements uh, that we know. I've been advised not to sing the, uh, the element song by Tom Lira to, uh, 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 to describe this, um, for many reasons, time is one, I can't sing is the other. So let me suffice by just showing you, the highlighting the elements that I showed in the previous spectrum, where they are in the, uh, in the periodic table here. So you see that a lot of the elements are from exploding massive stars and exploding white dwarfs uh, from the RVS spectrum. Uh, and, and so this, uh, these are um, uh, supernovae, and in particular, focusing on the calcium line, which was the strongest line that you saw in the spectra, uh, calcium comes from, uh, from supernovae. So that's, uh, so all the calcium that you see in the, in the spectra that I'm showing you, uh, and also in your teeth and bones, and the milk in the coffee, which I'm very much looking forward to in a moment, all comes from uh, supernovae. So going back to how we actually measure the abundance of these uh, chemical elements. So we measure them relative, we essentially count the number of uh, well, through models, we, we compare the, the strength of the lines um, relative to the hydrogen in, in the star. And this is scaled to the same measurement in our sun. And so the abundance of these elements uh, uh, it can be measured in, in this way. And then what we do is we take an average over all these different elements or metals, and then this gives us the mean metallicity of the star. So this is where this term comes from. So we refer to metals as the individual elements and the metallicity uh, of the star. So this particular star um, has a metallicity of uh, minus 0.22 dex. So this is a, a logarithmic scale. So this means that this star has actually got half the metallicity of our sun because it's measured relative uh, to our sun. So in terms of uh, what this means in, in the life cycle of stars, we have uh, uh, star formation and then stars are, are born. Um, out of the interstellar medium, collecting up whatever chemical elements are, are present in the interstellar medium, and then live their lives, and then either give back elements to the interstellar medium by a planetary nebulae, which is the fate of our sun, or from uh, an exploding uh, for more massive stars uh, going off as a, as a, as a supernova. Um, and as I said, the, a lot of the elements in the RBS spectra um, come from supernova. And so it's in this way that the life cycle of stars uh, proceeds and the galaxy uh, is enriched in chemicals. So this particular spectrum is different to the previous one I'm showing you. This is the same metallicity as our sun. And uh, just by focusing on this particular iron line here, 
um, I'll just flip back and forth to show you. So this is back to the, uh, the lower metallicity star and then back to the high metallicity star. I can see the strength of the iron line uh, is less here and then is stronger, sorry, uh, here. And, and so that's how we're essentially able to compare all the strength of these lines to models in order to measure this, uh, this, this metallicity. So now I'm showing you guys all sky color map, which is a, a beautiful thing in itself. This is measured from the, the XP spectra, which you've heard about already this morning. And this is a kind of how we see Gaia through, the, through our eyes. So the, uh, the, and the, the dimensions and the senses that Jerry was talking about. So now if we put our chemical glasses on, we can see, uh, the, the ga we can see our galaxy in the chemical dimension. So this is Gaia's all sky metallicity map. And if, we're, uh, if, if DNA um, is a bit like uh, metallicity, uh, in the, it's, it's the chemical fingerprint of stars, then mapping the galaxy's um, uh, metallicity is a bit like the Human Genome Project. So you can see the color code here, we've got higher metallicity in red and lower metallicity in blue. So this map is made from nearly 6 million stars, so it's the largest metallicity map ever published. So the, the state of the art until today uh, was based on ground-based uh, spectra. So uh, high resolution spectra comparable to, uh, to Gaia's radio velocity spectrometer. There were fewer than 1 million of these obtained over the last 100 years. And now today we're publishing um, nearly, um, the metallicities from nearly 6 million. It's the first all sky metallicity map from any mission. And it's the first metallicity map to use spectroscopy from space. So your eye is drawn to the, uh, the band here uh, in red, which was the higher metallicity um, component of it, and also the, the blue part here with the lower metallicity. So these are due to different parts of the galaxy. So this is a cartoon of our galaxy. Here's our sun uh, residing in the thin disk, and there's a thick disk um, within, within that, that resides there, uh, and then the bulge and the galactic center here. Now, when we see these stars in the plane here, we're looking towards uh, the center of the galaxy, uh, but within the thin disk. And those dust lanes that you saw in the beautiful image earlier are obstructing our view of, of the center here. And so we're seeing stars closer to us in the thin disk. And so these are more, these have uh, higher metallicity. But when we look out of the plane, we're looking uh, along these sight lines here. So we're looking out of our thin disk home into the thick disk. Uh, which is, has a, a low metallicity, as does the bulge, uh, which explains why we have low metallicity features um, here in the, in, the, in the two squares. So I'm now going to show you um, uh, an animation of, uh, of, of Gaia. Um, I recommend uh, getting the full 4K version of this um, back home, and putting it on as, as large a screen as you can. It has a soundtrack. Um, uh, uh, which is very nice as well. I, I won't play uh, the soundtrack, uh, but I'll just speak over um, a little bit of, of it uh, as it runs. So this is uh, Gaia spinning in space. And now uh, we're color coding the stars according to the metallicity that's been measured from the um, spectra. So blue is uh, lower metallicity, uh, red is higher metallicity and green is in between. So now this animation is really turning science fiction into science fact, because we're using Gaia's um, positions and distances uh, to tell us where the stars are. And we can fly through and we can color code all of these stars according to what they're made of. And so Guy really is giving us a toolkit to understand the Milky Way, as, as Mark mentioned. So now we're flying thousands of light years towards uh, the galaxy center. Uh, we're obviously going to take some time. Um, uh, and now we zoom out. So this is an animation, sorry, this is a, a, an artist's impression of the galaxy uh, from above. Uh, here's the sun. And so now we're, so now we're looking at the, uh, uh, the metallicity map uh, that I showed you before, except we're using Gaia's uh, uh, distances and, and positions to put those stars uh, on the Milky Way as looking down from below. So the sample is dominated by dwarf stars, which is why we can't see uh, a, a metallicity gradient particularly well here. But when we select giant stars, which are intrinsically brighter and sample a much larger volume, we can see this beautiful gradient from green to blue here, which means we're going from medium metallicity 
uh, to lower metallicity here from the inner to the outer of the galaxy. Uh, so this is a bit like the, the metallicity gradient that Jerry showed earlier, except we're using um, uh, uh, many stars and a different tracer. So the, ah, oh, sorry, apologies for the, this hasn't come out very well. This is showing the, the metallicity gradient here. This is the, uh, the metallicity on the, on the y-axis against the radius on the r-axis. Uh, so this is the, yeah, the radius of the galaxy from the galactic center here uh, to the outskirts. And what you won't be able to read particularly well uh, is that these are selecting different distances above and below the plane. And what's remarkable is that the, when you select a sample below and above the plane, is how, how closely they match each other. And so we've got very strong uh, symmetry uh, in the galaxy, in the thin disk. Of course, the most important feature, uh, as, as you've already seen, is this, is this metallicity gradient here uh, as we go out of the galaxy. So the Gaia distances and chemistry together gives us these gradients and this unprecedented spatial coverage and the numbers of stars uh, give us these trends that we can see both below and above the, the, the plane. And the, the vertical symmetry uh, within these galactic disks, uh, these impose important constraints um, for simulations. Uh, so they can really help to tell us how the, the thin disk itself formed from, a, from an evolution and the chemistry point of view, and how much accretion, how many small galaxies came in and hit the Milky Way and didn't perturb it enough such that we can still see these patterns today. So guys, radial velocity spectrometer is providing chemistry for the first time in this Gaia data release on an unprecedented scale. So these are just a, a reminder of the numbers. So nearly 6 million with the mean metallicity, the chemical abundances, uh, which I showed you um, the different uh, uh, elements in the star, you can get those for, for nearly two and a half million. And the spectra, as Mark already mentioned, there's nearly 1 million of those being, uh, being released today. So I've just given you a really quick snapshot of this, of this uh, performance verification paper, the chemical cartography of the Milky Way. It's going to be published uh, in, uh, in about 45 minutes um, with the rest of the Gaia data, uh, along with a much longer version of the animation. So, the, uh, so I've just finished with the, the sentence here. The, the Gaia collaboration is excited to share these data with the world and to see what new discoveries it brings. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to look at my colleagues at the back and see if there's any questions to the speakers. You want to ask? I'm going to ask one myself, actually, which is um, thinking about, perhaps there's one for Mark as well, and uh, we get a lot of um, questions to the public at the RAS about things like dark matter, and I wonder if this is shedding any light on that at all. Uh, well, yes, it definitely, it definitely will. I mean, I don't think any of the performance verification papers have directly uh, constrained the dark matter in the measurements that they've been taking. Uh, but knowing the more information we have about how stars are moving in the Milky Way will tell us, as Mark was explaining, uh, about the gravitational potential, which, which explains how those stars move. Um, and having the chemistry dimension to that as well just gives a richer picture to, uh, to how the galaxy formed and evolved. Thank you, okay. Um, next up, we have another set of speakers introducing the final session, which is more about the scientific data. So I'm not going to try and do their short biogs for each of them because they're all pretty much all three on in sequence. I don't know if we've agreed a particular order, actually. I don't mind who goes first, but um, yeah, it's Ian, Ian. there we go. Excellent. That makes a lot of sense, really. So Ian Jones is the chief executive of uh, Goonhilly here, and he's here to, uh, to start. I think you all have about three or four minutes each just to uh, constrain you. So, so Ian Jones, over to you. There we go. That's the right button. There we go. Sort of the same button. So welcome, uh, everyone, to, uh, to, to being here at the Earth Station. And uh, we're really delighted to be hosting uh, this uh, data drop of, uh, of Gaia uh, today. Uh, Jim Hilly was here really from the beginning of the space age in the 1960s, and since that last 60 years of the year. And um, so I'm, I'm being waved up by my colleague there. I'm okay, mate. <laughs> so, um, so, so it's, it's our 60th birthday this year, but, but 
Brimfleet has had a, a, a reincarnation in the last few years, and it's now a privately owned company. And, and one of the things that we wanted to do as, as a company here uh, was particularly to engage with the scientific community, uh, because as a commercial organization, there's so much um, really new uh, engineering that comes out of the science that, that you all do. Uh, and we've been using that to great effect here at Bin Heavy. Uh, the dish here uh, that you can see uh, on the right is uh, Bin Heavy 3, it's built in 1974. Uh, and that has a state of the art interferometer uh, built at Oxford University. Uh, and our dish, Bin Heavy 6, uh, has just been up converted with the uh, um, very close collaboration with the European Space Agency. Uh, and is now the world's first private deep space uh, antenna. Uh, and the dish has, has now been started to use, uh, be used for uh, various different ESA missions. Uh, we, we regularly communicate with Mars Express, uh, but we're really delighted now that we are also working with Gaia. Uh, and so uh, we've, we've just started to, to download data from, from Gaia, and we'll be doing some more so in the future. So I think it's, it's really fantastic to, to be able to host you here to find out about the amazing science you've been doing in the past. Uh, and hopefully we'll be working with you much more in the future and uh, downloading more data. So thanks very much indeed. Thank you for being very you know, prompt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think I'll bring in uh, Caroline next. Uh, which I think, are you head of space science at the UK Space Agency? Huh? Fantastic time. Caroline Harper. Oh, right, just again. What's that? 7C. That's very well remembered. Excellent. <laughs> No idea why I just clicked that one. So. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here uh, and to join with my colleague Ian and subsequently um, Mike uh, to welcome you all uh, to this Gaia DR3 event. Uh, as Robert said, I'm head of space science at the UK Space Agency, um, and the space science team at the UK Space Agency has been involved with Gaia for over a decade since the Space Agency was created actually, and, and for some of us since before the Space Agency was created, working in STFC. So it's immensely the tremendous success that Gaia is and is going to be in the future. 1.8 billion stars mapped with unprecedented precision and some of those objects are 400,000 times fainter than we can see with the human eye. There's a, a, a well-known analogy that some of you will be familiar with, but it bears repeating. For the brightest objects that Gaia observes, that what it can do is equivalent to being able to pinpoint a one pound coin on the surface of the moon when standing on the earth. Absolutely phenomenal. So for me, it's all about the people, the incredibly talented scientists and engineers that have worked on Gaia to make it the success it is today. There are around two and a half thousand people in the Gaia consortium and counting, coming from over 20 countries, all working together to process and analyze the data and really demonstrating beautifully the internationally collaborative nature of space science missions. And the UK, as we've heard, has a leading role in that consortium. Well, here we see the five key goals of the new National Space Strategy, which was published late last year. And you can see that leading pioneering scientific discovery and inspiring the nation is right at the heart of the new strategy. And in the UK Space Agency, we invest in space science missions to ensure that our scientists are at the forefront of new scientific discoveries around the world and to ensure that the UK reputation as a world leader in space science continues. But we also invest uh, to grow our space economy because the challenges in technology and the development of, of new technology for these missions to answer the next big questions uh, in, in space science 
is a huge technology push and that uh, drives innovation which can be spun out into commercial space and also into other sectors. So here we see some of the, the hardware involvements in Gaia in the development of the mission before it launched. Uh, Astrium in Stevenage, now part of Airbus Defence and Space, uh, built the service module for the spacecraft on the left there. And in Chelmsford, Teledyne E2V provided the CCD detectors for the 1 billion pixel camera, the largest focal plane ever flown in space. So we've been hearing how UK scientists are leading the way in, in the, the research consortium to, to process and analyse the data. Uh, but we mustn't forget that UK companies also played a very significant role in developing the mission in the first place. And now, of course, we've got Gunhilly involved. Um, it's really an exciting time, I think, to be in the space business in Cornwall. There are many developments around the county, uh, not least of which, of course, is the new key spaceport uh, just up the way. And the, the exciting developments here at Goonhilly, allowing us to, to communicate directly with deep space science missions in the UK for the first time. So what's next for Gaia? Well, uh, we've heard a little bit about the publications that are coming out of Gaia now. So I'm going to give you a, a different statistic. Um, the, the ESA holds about 11% of if you like, the global market share of science publications around the world. And since 2019, around 50% of those publications have been using Gaia data. That's a lot of papers. And so it's, it, it's very exciting. We've heard that Gaia is going to be a tool that's going to be used uh, for all areas of astronomy in the future. Uh, one really good example is that some of the uh, targets that are being selected for closer scrutiny by the James Webb Space Telescope are being chosen using Gaia data. And since we're talking about James Webb, I'm going to close with this slide. Some of you may have seen it before. I find this tremendously pleasing. Um, this is James Webb snapped by Gaia. In the larger box on the left hand side there, you can see in the center there's a slightly bigger blob, that's James Webb. The others are artifacts, uh, they can be calibrated out, they don't affect any of the science. But, but there we are, there's James Webb in the centre, and the smaller box is James Webb again, still in Guy's field of view around two hours later. Um, so James Webb, of course, is another success story for the UK. Uh, that's for another day, though. We're uh, eagerly awaiting the uh, first science data results from James Webb sometime in July. And in the meantime, ESA and NASA have promised that Webb will return the favour and will take some snaps of Gaia for us in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing, I'm guessing, your social media posts of those two accounts retweeting each other. Um, so uh, <laughs> next up is, our, uh, well, effectively my de facto elected boss, the uh, president of the Royal Astronomical Society, so I hope he's not too offended at being last in this slot here, but over to uh, Professor Mike Evans. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much. I'll stand here. Can you hear me all right? I hope the microphone's working okay. Um, I've only been president for RAS for about... Uh, two weeks, three weeks. Um, uh, it's a great honor. And it makes me realize because the first president of Herschel, um, who did so much in setting up the idea that, that we had a galaxy and doing sort of density counts, the sort of things we've seen on the screen today, for the first time and, and trying to map what he thought was our island uh, in the universe, uh, aided by his uh, sister, Caroline Herschel, who in fact was quite uh, important in revising and correcting a lot of star catalogues. So catalogues would have been familiar in that time. And in 1820, it was uh, when the Royal Astronomical Society was founded. And when it was founded, one of the missions that it sort of adopted was to map the whole skies as deeply as they could. And that, of course, is something which very much is continuing with the Gaia mission uh, to this day. Uh, 
doing sort of scientific mapping became began to become possible when parallaxes were first measured in order to get the distance to the stars. I, it was known from antiquity that they were a long way away, but how far wasn't really established until Bessel in uh, 1838, I think it was. Uh, I don't remember it, I've just read about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, managed to get the first parallax, a reliable parallax of a star. Then uh, another of our presidents, Sir William Huggins, in I think 1868, was I think one of the first person, I'm not sure if the very first, but one of the first persons to measure a radial velocity of a star. He married, measured Sirius and its radial velocity and realized this was a good thing to do. And so putting together, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the studies of chemical evolution or chemical abundances in stars in the 20th century with the radial velocities and the positions and the distances, of course, were laying the foundations for Gaia. But it's as you've seen with the numbers that are now possible, uh, I can't go back, I, I was looking back to 1820 when the Royal Astronomical Society was, was, was formed. I can't go back that far, but I can go back 50 years from when I started as a research student. And when I started as a research student, if you ask for parallaxes of stars, there were maybe 50, 100, reliable parallaxes, probably not very many more than, than, than that. That's only 50 years ago. And this revolution of being having accurate parallaxes, accurate positions, accurate radial velocities, accurate pro proper motions, and accurate chemistry for those stars is a real revolution. Uh, and the, it, it, as it's saying, is it's revolutionizing uh, our view of the galaxy and will from that revolution hours are over overall view of how the how the universe has changed so a long history of 200 years suddenly accelerating with a fantastic amount of data in recent times very very impressive and i'm really looking forward to the results coming out thank you And Nick has been a uh, Gaia Science Team Member since the mission was adopted in 2007. He's now the Principal Investigator of the UK Gaia Team based at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. And he's been actually instrumental in pulling all this together today. And I should also say that Nick helped us enormously last month at our first ever RAS parliamentary reception when he showed dozens of MPs and peers uh, Gaia data in 3D with virtual reality. Etc. And I don't think he stopped for two hours, such as the enthusiasm. You know, they, they didn't come to the well, some of the speeches were excellent, actually, but I don't think they came for that. They did go away uh, remembering the headsets. So uh, and today, uh, Nick's here to talk about some of the fantastic work he's done on this. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to introduce really my colleague uh, Daphne Evans, who's going to be talking about about the content uh, more more generally and this is just to reinforce i think what caroline uh, just said actually is is the is the people behind this there's a, a, a number of people across europe and there's the uk identified and we've got major contribution providing many of the uh, the components of the of the data but it is a, a a truly you know uk with european partners effort and here we are well this is reflective zoom and covid but but these are you have the fake around Europe who are involved in this to get and the community is going to do the about one minute after 11 o'clock UK time the first uh, uh, peer review paper will be popping onto uh, onto onto the archive. There's always the rush to get the science out, uh, and typically at the moment we're running at about five peer reviewed papers, new scientific papers every day. It really is an amazing mission. I thought it was good to pop up the faces behind uh, the UK team. I think this is nearly everybody uh, that we've uh, managed to uh, get together in one one screenshot. So. Um, bringing people together. So these are the, the, the team, if you like, across the, across the UK, uh, from uh, uh, Cambridge and uh, UCL, MSSL, uh, UCL, uh, Bristol, Edinburgh and, and Leicester. Uh, and uh, it's such a wonderful team of people to work for and work with. Uh, uh, and they've been 
instrumental in getting out an absolutely incredible uh, data set. And there I find out that the microphone didn't actually work, so another one. <laughs> so you missed all of that, but never mind. Uh, just the, the, the comment also, uh, uh, sort of following up on, uh, on, on, on Ian and Caroline, just to sort of say, why are we in Goonhilly? <laughs> That's, uh, um, this is just a graphic top left showing where actually Gaia is, and it's observing away at the moment. It's been observing since, uh, well, it launched, uh, um, it's been observing sort of, um, scientifically survey operations since uh, 2014, and it's probably going to observe through to 2025, uh, continuously scanning the sky. And it's about a million miles away from, from Earth at the moment, uh, and it's in a sort of orbit around that point, the second Lagrangian point, so-called. Um, um, it downlinks data routinely, more or less every day. Uh, so it, it accumulates data, its observations, and it brings them back to ground. Usually it's using uh, one of the main uh, uh, dishes in the um, ESA Deep Space Net uh, Network, the uh, Sabribros uh, uh, dish uh, outside Madrid, for instance. But the Goonhilly, uh, it, it, got, it got an upgrade there, but it's a 32 meter at the moment. Maybe they put a bit more on at some point, but it's now been integrated into the ESA Deep Space ne Network. And it's uh, now uh, being one of, one of the dishes that they can call upon for uh, when they need to download more Gaia data, when Gaia is uh, you know, accumulating more data when it's scanning the galactic, uh, galactic plane, for instance. And it's really nice to see that that is uh, uh, now part of the uh, um, uh, ESA Deep Space Network. And it's routine. Uh, uh, downlinking data from Integral and Mars, uh, Mars Express. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's really part of the uh, ESA, ESA family from, from that point of view. And that's a, a capability that we have here in the UK. In terms of how that works, in terms of downlinking data, well, guide downlink to, to the ground stations. It then gets uh, sent over to the Mission Operations Center in Darmstadt, uh, which is uh, uh, not so far from uh, Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, then the data gets sent over to the Star Operations Center in, in Madrid, and then from their main data to Madrid, uh, data gets put out to the various processing centers, so the Cambridge Processing Center for Photometry, and then those data are analyzed and then combined into what eventually is it's the release. So the, this is quite a complex uh, situation and a lot of moving parts. So that's basically the story of how we get the catalog out. The journey is just about to begin, 11 o'clock. We're going to go uh, live to see the, uh, the red button of the putting out the data. But before that, we will move to my colleague uh, Daffid, who will then present uh, the overview of the complete data set. So over to you, uh, Daffid. Um, I'm going to give a uh, so while I was writing this uh, a couple of questions uh, from uh, Zoom, so it'd be nice to bring them in at the end if we can. Just before. Um, not only have we got um, the um, quality of data, we've also now got the quantity as well. Um, in December of uh, 2020, um, we released the previous data release, early data release three, and this was the largest and most accurate astrometric um, um, and photometric survey that had been um, give, um, um, released. So with this data release, it will be the um, largest ever low resolution spectroscopic sur survey that was um, described by um, um, Georgia and Francesca. And it's also the largest ever radial velocity survey. So this is, this is um, um, that was described by Mark earlier on. It's the largest collection of astrophysical data for Milky Way stars. And George covered um, uh, some of those aspects. For many classes of variable stars, it's the largest survey ever. For binary stars, the survey that's done 
it surpasses all the work that they've done on binary stars for the last two centuries. You, you, you collect the data from the ground for two centuries and you get a certain accuracy of results. For the three years that we're pub um, um, publishing data uh, that's gone into DR3, um, we're now more accurate than, than, than that data. Um, it's also the highest accuracy survey of asteroids. Um, we've got the um, very accurate orbits, but we've also got compositions for these. So um, this gives, um, we can actually tell something about the geology of, or the surface geology of these um, asteroids because of the, ref the amount of starlight that's, or the sunlight that's reflected from these um, asteroids. And also we've got the Andromeda Galaxy photometric survey as well. So the previous um, 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 data release um, um, had um, 1.8 billion stars. And th this is all, again, part of this data release as well. But there was 1.5 billion um, um, stars with brightnesses, color, positions, proper motions, and distances. This one adds to this by giving um, 220 million spectra and from this, we can get temperature, mass, age, color, and metallicity. From the high resolution spectroscopy, we, um, there'll be a million spectra um, where we can get the chemical compositions from. There's uh, more than just the million. And there will be um, almost 6 million um, astrophysical um, parameters being uh, derived from the high resolution spectra. And also from the high resolution spectra, you get the radial velocities. And there'll be 33 million. Um, um, radial velocities release. This is the, um, the uh, measure of this, how fast the star is moving away from us or towards us. And it then gives us the third velocity dimension, which helps us with the um, understanding the galactic um, structure and its evolution. Um, and from doing this, um, we can rewind what the galaxy is now to find out what it was like in the past and also fast forward it into the future as well there will be almost a million binary star um, um, systems um, catalogued. Um, these will be very accurate. They've got, and they will have orbits and masses, um, which is very important for the understanding of the physics of these. Um, also something that I'm involved with is the uh, variable stars part of the work. Um, there will be 10 million uh, released of these, and these are stars that are varying uh, with brightness over time. Um, with the low resolution spectra, as a scientist, when we look at spectra, what we normally look at are graphs. And we like seeing um, the lines moving up and down as, as a function of, um, of, of wavelength. And that's what we're getting, we're studying to get the science out of it. But it's taking a spectrum is exactly like scanning a barcode. Um, the dips and the, and, the, um, and the peaks are exactly the same sort of thing as you get in a barcode. And similar to what we have with the barcode, once you've taken um, a spectrum or scanned a barcode, you know what that thing actually is. Um, the previous releases gave us the positions and the brightnesses. With this one, we'll have um, 220 million spectra. And from these, um, we actually then know that, um, what these stars are. So this was um, shown by, um, um, by Georgia earlier on. And um, this is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, um, which is like an atlas for astronomers. So we have uh, the majority of the stars on the main sequence. We've got the white dwarfs, the red giants. Um, the sun is about there, I think, um, or would be. Um, and then the other two here show the average spectra of the stars that are in each of these boxes here. And you can see um, that these spectra vary as you go along the different parts of the um, HR diagram. And um, um, this tells us a lot about the, the, the physics of the various um, stars. So with the high resolution spectra, um, these are much more detailed than uh, the previous um, um, spectra. And from these, you can get the radial velocities, which is the, uh, measured from the Doppler shift for about 33 million. And uh, 1 million of these stars, uh, of, of uh, these spectra will be released. And as George has mentioned, um, the 
um, with the spectra, you've got various absorption lines within the spectrum. And then from the depth of those, you can then work out what, um, um, what chemical elements are actually within those stars. Um, not only that, by measuring these, uh, the various lines, you can also um, work out um, how fast these stars are rotating as well. And there's about 3.5 uh, million um, rotational velocities released as well. So we don't only measure stars, we also measure um, the asteroids as well um, within the solar system. Um, there'll be about 150,000 um, asteroids detailed in this data release. And these include the, um, the, the main belt asteroids, which are between uh, Mars and Jupiter, but we've also got the uh, near-Earth asteroids, the, uh, the uh, Jupiter Trojans, which are um, asteroids that are in the same orbit as Jupiter, then the, the centaurs um, between uh, Jupiter and Neptune, and the ones even also uh, beyond Neptune. And the, uh, one of the main things that we get from these will be the positions and the orbits of the, um, of the asteroids. But because we've got spectra as well, um, we can actually get um, um, details of the composition of what that um, asteroid is, uh, is on the surface of the asteroid. Um, the asteroid itself doesn't shine with any light, but it reflects our, the, the sunlight. And if you find, if you then measure how different the reflected sunlight is with respect to the light coming from the sun, um, you can actually find out what actually is on the surface of the asteroid. Also, if you measure the um, how the brightness changes for the asteroid, um, this gives us valuable information about the shape and the rotation um, um, of the asteroid. So we also have variables being released. Um, DR3 will have about 10 times more uh, variables in the, in the, in the, in the catalogue than in DR2, about 100, well, sorry, about 10 million variables. Um, and if, there will be 24 different types of variability. Um, and these include the eclipsing binaries where um, a star passes in front of another star, uh, causing its brightness to change. Uh, you also have pulsating and rotating variables. Um, and um, one of the other more um, um, in, um, interesting ones are the cataclysmic variables, where one star um, deposits its um, material um, onto a disk around a white dwarf, and, peri and periodically that builds up to being um, enough to cause an explosion and a sudden brightness change, um, which is called a nova, and um, um, we can measure um, um, that variability. There's also exo exoplanetary transits, which is the same as the eclipsing binaries, but it's where a planet goes in front of the star rather than another star. So the other big thing that um, um, with this, which I'm personally involved with, is the um, and, uh, Gaia Andromeda uh, Photometric Survey. Um, the Andromeda Galaxy is um, the Milky Way's big sister. It's just like the uh, Milky Way. It's a spiral galaxy, it's slightly bigger than the Milky Way. And this survey will release uh, 1.2 million sources um, in uh, the epoch photometry in three different colors. Um, and epoch photometry just means that we've got individual measurements as a function of time. So this is for all sources um, within this area, not just the variables. And this then um, allows astronomers to test their, their, their algorithms um, to see how they can process the data themselves and also investigate the, um, uh, the data quality of the satellite. And this will be then a taster of the next data release that comes where the epoch photometry for almost 2 billion sources um, um, will be um, present. So just to give a little bit of an idea of why this is um, so significant is that one of the big advantages from Gaia is that you've got simultaneous observations in three colors. So you've got the three colors here and you can see that the dots are forming exactly the same pattern as each other. So we know that that is then intrinsic to the star that the star itself is varying, and it's not just a problem with one of these three measures. And if you actually take a look at, if this uh, the, the measure um, the periodicity within uh, this data, you can find that it's got a very nice period and that uh, if you fold the data, you get a very nice wave pattern here and that all the different colors 
are matching up on exactly the same wave pattern. And using these correlation techniques, variables can be found um, much more reliably. So if you use this variability measure and then add it to the HR diagram, this um, atlas that um, astronomers use, you can find out that certain regions um, stand out as having more variability than others. So the seven points here, these are all um, cataclysmic variables, uh, those stars that um, periodically um, explode. Uh, you've also got up here um, the, uh, uh, the long period variables, which are red giants that are varying over um, hundreds of days um, in time. You've also got on the main sequence here, you've got a sequence of um, um, variables that is on the top edge here. And these are probably all call, caused by some form of um, um, binary interaction and binary nature of the stars. But then also, if you've got very good eyesight, you can see that there's a little ridge of increased variability here. We don't know what that is. We've still got to find, try and find out what, what that actually is. So there will be new science coming up. It's not just we, this is what we've already found. There's also new discoveries to be made. So Gaia DF3 represents a great leap forward for astronomy. But to be a bit more precise, it's another great leap forward for astronomy. So it builds up on, on DR2. And an astronomer said um, from, uh, from the US said of DR2 that it is mind blowing. DR3 will be even better. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, for yes, Fantastic. indeed. Perfect. Okay. We've got a, a couple of um, questions that have come through from Zoom, actually. Um, one relates to a dark matter again and just asking whether. Um, it's possible to map the density of dark matter in the galaxy using Gaia. Um, I wondered if you, you might be able to answer that. Also, Jerry Gilmore is back in the room. I don't know. We might need to get a mic on him quickly, though, if we do that. I think that that will this uh, using the um, uh, the radial velocity um, data in combination with the proper motions. I'm fairly certain that um, dark matter studies will be um, um, will be perfectly doable from um, this Gaia data release. Okay, uh, Jerry, do you want to add on that? Uh, yeah. Well, Big uh, challenges and most topical interests in dark matter, which Gaia is providing the ma major advance in, is whether or not there's a variety of dark matter which can cool down and form in a thin layer in the disk of the Milky Way. And it's a particular prediction of one of the supersymmetric advances in particle physics that this stuff should exist. So there shouldn't be just one sort of dark matter at all. There should be a sort that forms a, a very thin cold disk. <clears throat> so to measure the mass in the disk with sufficient precision, you need large samples of stars with good positions and good three-dimensional velocities and excellent extinctions. And Gaia is providing that uh, and is the only thing that it turns out that the Milky Way disk is a little bit more complicated than people had thought. And so there's some more sophisticated modeling required than, than the straightforward. But nonetheless, Gaia itself is providing a direct test of a plausible theory in elementary particle physics through the dark matter tests. Thank you. Okay, and the other one we have is uh, slightly more complicated for a question just from Zoom, but it says uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law can be used to obtain a star's radius from absolute magnitude and effective temperature. But what's the best way to use Gaia data to infer that a star's mass and hence density? Is that possible? Um, the best way is from the binary star st um, uh, measurements, I would say. Um, that's the probably the most accurate one, but I think that you can also do that with the um, with the RVS spectra. I think I'm not entirely sure about that one, but the best way is from the binary star um, data. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I should say now. I know Joe's probably going to do another interview, and uh, we're coming to the end of this. Unless there are any other questions, actually, from anybody in the room as well, you're welcome to pipe up uh, or uh, any online. I'll look at my colleagues at the back to see if any hands wave. Um, other than that, I think it's really, we should just uh, take a moment to thank all the speakers who've come down here today and, uh, you know, thank you to everybody contributing online. So we really very much appreciate it. And it's, we look forward to great things in this mission. I'm very impressed, actually, that as soon as the data set is out, you see a flurry of papers. Yes. 
There's no, no messing around with that as soon no. as astronomers get a data set. So um, with that, I think we can thank you. We can wait a couple of minutes before we switch over to the feed from uh, ESAC in Spain, I believe that is, isn't it? Where they'll be yeah, actually going good. through the release of the data itself as it goes live to the public. I'm assuming, by the way, that as a public data set, does that mean in theory anyone in the world can access it? They don't need Absolutely. To they don't need to be an academic. I'm not saying you necessarily be able to interpret it easy, but it's fantastic <laughs> to think that, you know, genuine open science, actually, it's really great that, you know, we, we do share these things so well. So, I do get emails from um, um, amateur astronomers who are wanting to use the data in some way, specialist. Um, um, data bits, but and if yeah. there are any amateur astronomers watching the stream, then yeah, that there's an offer for you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody. And uh, I think after this, after we put the switch to a second soul, there's an opportunity, perhaps I've asked Ian if we can, some of us can go and look around the site if you haven't done that before as well, which I, I do recommend. <laughs> seconds I think <laughs> and then the race is on to have the first paper <laughs> and I think they will see a spike in downloads from the uh, from the archive at this point you can see the the guy archive coming up you're also going to show Enjoy, query, discover, and tell the world. Remember to tweet hash Gaia DR3 if you find amazing things on the data. Everything good. Now, uh, we wanted to also share very quickly uh, a little uh, map of how people is connecting. This is this this is this is this is nice to see actually because I think you will see ping all of a sudden it lights up so hopefully they uh, they get to the page quickly. <laughs> so we have this uh, real time oh, map where you can see people from, from all the world. Oh yeah, so you the larger you see people, a balloon. The more connections. <laughs> this is a lower limit. We have people as you can see. Pretty much from from the whole from from around the whole world connecting and, and downloading data well, as we yes. speak. Of course, and you'll notice as well a lot of people in the uh, UK all these uh, the previous data. presentations so, yeah. about how so how many quite, people uh, quite, and how many scientific yeah. users have okay. this incredible data. And of course, the science community is very well aware. This is a, a real it's party. Quite early in the day there are thirty-seven America, so countries, yeah. over three hundred <laughs> users, they're, and they're over sixteen thousand truly users. dedicated. So, uh, yeah. This is a, a big celebration, it's worldwide. This is going for the scientific community, but it's also going to every citizen on earth. This is open to everybody. And if you think about it, this is fantastic. We're, pu we're putting out the most, the better astronomical data ever produced by orders of magnitude. And we're making this for free for the whole world to take, analyze and publish. And you can see the result, the worldwide implications of this kind of amazing work. So I would like to ask for a, just a final applause for everyone who's made this possible. Thank you very much.
it's a, it's very exciting to see the whole world. Ha, ha, ha.